Terry King, we are so lucky to have you with us. You presented um, t this morning and also we're on a panel, um, sort of where evidence meets narrative. So talking about what happens um, from science to podcasting to TV shows. And so before we get into your show, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself in case there's anybody, uh, I'd be surprised if there is, but anybody who doesn't know about what you do. So I am um, currently the director of the Miller Center for Evolution at the University of Bath, but my background is actually in archaeology. So first in Canada, then in the UK. And then I got really interested in how you can use genetics to answer questions in history and archaeology. So I ended up going to Leicester and doing my um, master's and my postdoc. I was really lucky I had Professor Sir Alec Jeffries, yeah. inventor of DNA fingerprinting, on my PhD panel, so I completely lucked out. And then I got asked to lead on the identification of King Richard III. So if anyone's heard of me, it's usually because of that. So now I'm an academic. I do a lot of kind of ancient and forensic DNA, but I also do a lot of television. I've just been asked to do kind of more and more, so I host, I'm hosting a true crime podcast at the moment called Head Number no. 7. I'm, I work in documentaries, but I also work on a television program called DNA Family Secrets. Well, we'd love to ask you about that. Can you tell us about the show and um, how that started for you? So people had kind of heard about me anyways, because I, I, you know, I do very bit, the bits of kind of science that I do often has, um, it's of an angle that's of real interest to the general public. So people had heard about me and the work I'd done on various bits and things. So I got contacted by this production company known as Minnow Films. And what they wanted to do was a, a program about using DNA to answer questions like finding um, family members. The first two series that we did, it had this particular format where two of the stories would be kind of a family history one, like I don't know who my father is, or I'm donor conceived, or that kind of thing. And then there was another one which would be a medical angle. So it would be somebody like, I know there's this genetic disease in my family and I want to know if I'm a carrier. And I loved that as a geneticist, because you think, well, it's genetics answering questions in kind of family history, but also this medical angle. And we did that for the first two series, and then they had kind of viewer feedback. And actually, the viewers were really interested in the family history side. So series three has all been family history. And basically, people come to us with kind of three main questions with an overarching one. So one is, I'm adopted. I want to know who my parents are, one or the other. Might be donor conceived, or they would like to know. Usually it's actually about donor siblings, less necessarily about the donor. And then one could be, I don't know who my biological father is, and that's either because they've grown up not knowing, or increasingly these days, people take a DNA test and they realize their biological father can't be the father they thought it was. And across all of this is often usually something around ancestry. So someone who's adopted doesn't know what their ancestry is, they'd like to know. So we use DNA to, to help people with all of those. I think that's remarkable, and I actually didn't know that it started out with a medical component as mm -hmm. well before it went more into the family yeah, history. Yeah. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what the show means to you? I know on the panel it was really interesting to hear that you know how it began from you you focusing on the scientific portion, but then you can't help but get involved in the stories. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I I, I say to people you'd have to have a heart of stone not to be moved by this. So we. We have people who come to us with really deep stories about, it's about identity. I think it's about who they feel they are and their place in the world. And I think that, um, I mean, I love it. I am so incredibly privileged to be a part of this program, to be able to use science to help these people. Um, yeah, and, and it was very sweet, as I said in my, my talk, that when they came to me, they were like, we have this lovely presenter, Stacey Dooley. She's going to be doing more of the touchy-feely side, and then you're the scientist kind of straight down the line. It's like, oh my goodness, you have the wrong girl, because <laughs> I am this massive empath, and I just can't help but kind of feel what they're feeling to some extent. I don't know how to explain it, but when we're filming, I kind of feel like we go into a bit of a bubble, and it's like just me and them and you don't even know the camera is there and I'm just talking them through their results and people complain that I talk really slowly on the program but it's because I'm telling people information that kind of really it's deeply affecting them and who they are and I, I often say it's like you can see who they are is kind of like for them is changing in front of your eyes and, and they're processing all of this stuff so I go quite slowly but yeah, it's, I love it. It's an amazing program. I am so lucky to be a part of it. 
I, I love that you go slowly because these are such sensitive and emotional topics and something that somebody's maybe wondered about their whole lives and now they're hearing something I, that could change their life. Oh, completely. Yeah. Um, and I think that it's being sensitive to that, to the fact that they're going to be hearing something that is going to change their place in the world, how they perceive themselves. Yeah. And I think it's being really sensitive to to what they are are likely to be going through. And that's one of the things that's so important on the program. We have a, a counselor, we have social workers, we have all of this support in the background. And I think the other really important thing about the program is that we are slightly unusual in that we show the reality of DNA testing in that Sometimes we're not able to answer somebody's question completely. We might be able to get them to a certain point, and we always say, "Look, it, give it six months, a year, two years. You might your question might be answered. We may never be able to answer it, but it's that reality of sometimes things aren't tied up in a nice, neat little bow. It's often complicated. These are humans that we're dealing with and difficult emotions, and so it's it's something where sometimes it it doesn't work out all like really amazingly and lovely and um, so we're trying to be there to support them for that and then you do get these these ones where oh my goodness like the, oh, just it's just amazing where they're enveloped into a family and and yeah just that resolution for people I think is really important. I think it's really interesting too. Do you think um, having this public forum has changed people's understanding of the limitations and and the capabilities? As you said, you know things may be answered in the future as the technology changes, and I I think the average person is now learning so much more than they ever knew before. Yeah, I, I completely agree, and I know that that's one of the things that people go. But wait a minute, you didn't answer their question, and we that's what's so important about our program is that we show that reality that it's it doesn't always work out completely right and it can take time and I think if people start to understand that that's what the reality of DNA testing is I think that's a really valuable thing that we can give people so that they they know themselves when they're working on this and sometimes they don't solve it they don't think it's, it's not about me it's about this is this is where we are with the with the DNA matches yeah absolutely are there any surprising or memorable stories something you could share oh oh my goodness so um Oh, which one? <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> we, we, one or two yeah. that we would love. <laughs> like that. So I think the one that affected me most in the first series was somebody called Margaret, who I talked about a little bit. So she had been, she knew she was adopted. She knew her mom was Irish. And she had waited and waited. You know, she has kids and she's looking after everybody else. And she retires and she finally thinks, no, I'm going to see if I can find out who my mom is. And she's very much aware that I, I may have left this too late. And I don't know, you know, even if you can find out who she was, the, the chances of her being alive are so slim. And she was alive. But she had dementia. So it's that bittersweet of you can meet her, but she might not remember you. But she tells this amazing story of going over and, you know, meeting her mom and her mom holding her hand. and. We think, from what she was saying, seemingly knowing who she was. And that was hugely poignant for her to meet her. And her mom suddenly passed away a few months later. So it was this, yeah, she'd done it just in time. And, and so it was so incredibly moving. And so with each series, I, I've gone home to my husband and gone, this is my Margaret for the next series. Kind of thing. Because he knew, I mean, I think this is the thing. You, it is impossible not to really kind of care for these people and to hope to be able to answer questions for them. And all of them are amazing. Um, yeah, just, just such extraordinary stories, these people. I, mean, I think it's been fantastic to watch the tra trajectory from, did you ever think when you were working on uh, the, the Richard III that this would be your future? No. <laughs> <laughs> so I had done little bits of television during my PhD because, and, and this is lovely, there's this growing interest in DNA and how it can be used to kind of connect past and present, family history, social history. So I love all of that. So I had been doing little bits. Um, the Richard III project obviously kind of put things on steroids a little bit, but to have the, the luck to be involved in a program like this, yeah, incredible. And and if you had said this to me, you know, when was it? We think it's about a decade ago that right, I was. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and to, to be here now, um, yeah, no, I'm just ridiculously lucky. 
Yeah. Um, I, I think it's your talent and, and kindness. Oh. Is, I mean, I've, I've loved watching what's happened. It's yeah. amazing. And you've been in the news again recently. Yeah, yes. so this is the, the Casper Hauser case. So I have a really lovely colleague slash friend called Walter Parson, who will be known to the forensics community. And he contacted me a few years ago saying he had a particular case. He couldn't tell me what it was about. Um, but would I be happy to be involved? And it was the Casper Hauser case. Um, and I had never heard of Casper Hauser, even when he told me what it was about. Um, but apparently incredibly famous in Europe. So this is a case where a young lad who's, he's about age 16, he turns up in Nuremberg, um, 1828, and uh, he can barely walk or talk. He can basically, he can write the name Casper Hauser, but doesn't seem to know what it means. Um, and he tells the story about having been kept essentially in a dungeon for as long as he can remember, somebody is feeding him and giving him water, but thinks there must be opium in it because he never sees anybody. Um, so he, you know, but somebody's looking after his personal hygiene, like you know, doing his hair and cutting his toenails and that kind of thing. So somebody's kind of looking after him, and that he says that you know, before he's released, somebody comes, teaches him how to write his name, and you know, says you know, teaches him how to say, "I want to be a cavalryman like my father was," and then walks him to Nuremberg and drops him there. Um, so he becomes a little bit of a celebrity. And there's rumors start to swirl because people think he might be the hereditary prince of Baden. So to understand this story, you have to go back a few generations where there's the Grand Duke of Baden. And he marries twice. So the dukedom is only going to pass down through the male line of the first marriage. And it has to exhaust that before anyone from the second marriage can become the duke. And what happens is it passes down a couple of generations, and then this couple, um, so this is Carl and his wife Stephanie de Beauharnais, they have five children, including a son who's apparently born quite healthy, but then dies sort of about three weeks later. So the dukedom kind of ends there. And people start going, oh, wait a minute. The dukedom then passed to someone from the second marriage. Was it actually the second wife who swapped these babies at at birth type thing. So she's apparently supposed to swap in, in the sickly child of one of her servants. And that actually this lad Caspar Hauser is that hereditary prince now 16 years old. Um, so it's been this long, long running um, kind of theory about this. So what Walter was asking was whether or not we'd be the second lab that was involved in testing hairs from this and female line relatives of Stephanie de Beauharnais and uh, showed that it couldn't possibly he wasn't the hereditary prince of Baden. So that's kind of finally put that one to rest. There had been a study that had been done previously about 20 years ago, um, but there had been some questions around it. So this hopefully now kind of, it, it corroborates that. Hopefully that finally ends that story. It's so interesting because it's really steeped in, uh, you know, controversy yeah, and conspiracy. mythology yeah. and conspiracy. Yeah, yeah. How does that feel then when the science, you know, uh, you know, answers the question. That oh, must be. I love it. I mean, don't you love that? That these days you can now use science, genetics, new technologies to be able to say something about historical questions in the past. It, it basically goes back to. So I was sitting there in a lecture in Cambridge, and it was the Romanov case. So Erica Hekelberg was talking to us about the Romanov case, and. I had been doing archaeology up to that point, and that was the case that turned it for me, that I was like, that's what I want to do, and that's what set me off on this trajectory. And now I get to work on cases like that, you know, solving mysteries using DNA. I, I absolutely love it. I think it's just, it's remarkable, both sides. How do you balance, you know, DNA family secrets and then, you know, the academic side and, and working on, you know, individual projects mm. like this? It's it's a lot of work, <laughs> but um, I also consider myself ridiculously lucky, which makes it much, much easier to do. But yeah, no, I, I love, of course, I, I absolutely love the academic side. And then I, get, I love that I get to work in television and radio, and it's bringing sometimes quite complicated scientific subjects to the public. I love doing that kind of thing. So yeah, I, again, I, I just, the amount of luck in my life, I think, to be able to work on these various things, I, I yeah, it's great. Well, I, I think it, it, part of it is just attracted to you as well. I mean, yeah. I really do. Is there, looking ahead, where, what, are, what are you working on now? Or what do you plan for the future? Yeah, so I'm working on a whole bunch of different cases. Um, 
some of which are under NDA, so I can't tell I would assume. Yeah. 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 So that is the really nice thing, is having done this project, you do get people contact you to work on, on different things. So one of the projects I'm working on is Jamestown, Virginia, so first permanent English settlement in the US, um, and working with the amazing archaeology team there and you know trying to identify individuals. So yeah, so that's one of my, I love that project. That's one of my, my favorites that I'm working on at the moment. I can't wait to hear what you find out. Yeah. That'll be incredible. Yeah. Well, you've definitely been with us uh, a couple different times, so uh, we always like to ask, you know, what are you looking forward to here? Why do you come back? How is this valuable for you? I mean, we were so lucky to have you on the panel today, but, you know, what, what uh, makes you say yes? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, well, first of all, it's a ridiculously prestigious conference, <laughs> so to be able to come is amazing. I love catching up with people. I've just had lunch uh, with somebody who is really sweet. So we've always corresponded and things like that over internet. We've had Zoom chats, but to actually meet her and have a chat with her in, in person. So um, it's the networking. It's the finding out what the latest technologies are. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I always love coming to ISHI. It's always a fantastic conference. Well, we are so lucky to have you this year, and thank you so much for taking time to talk with us. Troy, I always enjoy it so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you.